we need to stand and welcome her as she comes. Shall we praise the name of the Lord? Shall we praise the name of the Lord? Praise the name of Jesus. Wow. <laughs> what an introduction. Praise God. Thank you, honey. I do appreciate you. So I give honor to the Holy Spirit. Um, I want to greet our senior Pastor Peters, um, Pastor Jennifer, Pastor Les and Pixley, because you might pick this up online. Um, I want to greet all the brethren, all the visiting friends, the choir. I greet you all in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to greet my husband. He said a lot about me and I could say a lot about him. But what I will say is that he's my absolute best friend. My absolute best friend. He's a godly man and a man of integrity and a great father. And also, I want to give special greetings to my Auntie Casita there. Praise God. Stand, Auntie, stand. <laughs> Let's give her a hand there. Praise God. She is my auntie, but she's like a mummy to me. And I thank God for you, auntie. I really give God thanks and praise for you. So today, I really want to speak to us today under the heading of uh, devotion, but who is he? And I just want to say to you, um, Neutral Outreach Church, and for anyone who's thinking about what church to go to online, come here. We have received such love, such hospitality, such kindness in this house. But most of all, this is where the presence of the Lord dwells. I remember that one of the first times, many of you will know my story about how I ended up coming here. I was unwell at home. Um, the TV so happened to turn on the channel for Knock. And I was listening to a sermon and I got healed in my bed from listening to a sermon from this church. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of Jesus. So this is where the spirit of the Lord dwells. And I'm really excited, really excited, because I know that the Lord is going to do marvelous things in this house. Praise God. Are we excited? Are we excited? Praise God. There is much that we can do when we work together. Praise the name of the Lord. So if you have your Bibles, um, if you could turn to Isaiah 53. And this is going to be my root scripture for the word that I have for you today. So we are speaking about devotion, but the title of my message to you today is, Who is He? Uh, you may see me fluctuate between different versions, but please do bear with me. Praise God. So Isaiah 53 verses 3 to 5. So it says, uh, this is Isaiah the prophet talking, is actually prophesying about Jesus. So he says, he was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weaknesses he carried. He was our sorrows, the weight that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. And I want to just cross-reference that, if I may, and um, if we can just go over to First Peter 
praise God, uh, chapter 2, verse 24. Praise the mighty name of Jesus. And it says pretty much the same thing that Isaiah was saying here. He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds, you are healed. Does anyone believe that word today? Praise the mighty name of Jesus. Who is he? Who yonder stole at his feet? The shepherd's fall. Who is he in deep distress? Fasting in the wilderness, tis the Lord. Oh, wondrous story, tis the Lord, the King of. At his feet we humbly fall, crown him, crown him, Lord of all. If you could help me, musicians. Who is he in deep distress, fasting in the wilderness? Who is he, the people bless for his words? Of gentleness, tis the Lord, a wondrous story, tis the Lord, the King of glory, at his feet we humbly fall. Crown him, crown him, Lord of all. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Praise God, tis the Lord. A wondrous story. Tis the Lord, the King of glory. And at his feet we humbly fall. Crown him, crown him, Lord of all. Praise God. I'm hoping by the time I have finished delivering this message today, that song will come alive to each and every one of us in our hearts. So if you've got your Bibles or your devices, uh, we're going to turn now over to Genesis uh, chapter 3. And you can cross-reference what I'm saying with uh, Genesis, but I'm not going to read through the verses. So it's Genesis chapter 3. Um, from one um, right the way through the chapters. So please do study that. 
when you get a chance. It's always important that when we come to church, we make notes so we can take in what God is giving to us as we come into the house of God so that we can eat them, digest them, marinate them, and then those words can come out of us as life. Amen? So Genesis 3, um, from chapters 1 to 6, all the way through, it chronicles the fall of man. So my first point is the fall of of man. So by the fall of man, what I'm talking about is one that moves from high to low. And I'm going to share a funny story with you. You may not find it funny, but I did. I remember uh, many, many years ago, me and a friend of mine, we were going to a church service and we we dressed up kind of looking, well, I thought we looked kind of stush. I had them days I could wear stilettos, can't do that now. And I was there clicking myself. And then we went to mount a bus to get on the bus and I found myself between the pavement and the bus. (laughs) Praise God. So I went from a height to a low standard. (laughs) Praise God. Yes, so from a place of high to a place of low, from a place of holiness and righteousness to a place of sin, disobedience, death, and decay. From a place of intimacy with God to a place of broken fellowship with God. So let's just quickly look at this word sin just for a moment. So the word sin um, literally means missing the mark. It indicates the failure to be what one should be or, in fact, to do what one should do. So we're going back to the fall of man. So originally, man was made to be the created image of God, to live in union with God's divine life and to rule over all creation. Can I get an amen right there? So we see here in Genesis chapter 3 now where the serpent comes. We all know this scripture really well. Where the serpent comes to the first man and the first woman that God created. Adam and Eve. Praise God. And he tempts the woman and then tempts the man and we know that they rebel against the creator. Amen. You with me? Okay. So Adam and Eve essentially then fall into temptation and they sin. Now I'm going somewhere. We're still under that topic, devotion and who is he? Okay, so they eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which God told them not to do. Oh boy. Now, unfortunately, the fall of Adam and Eve brought about consequences, not just for Adam and Eve, praise God, but consequences and repercussions for all of humanity. How many times have our parents told us not to do something? Praise God. You know, you decide uh, when we were younger, um, many of you who are probably around my age, and just to say, I do have a 29-year-old daughter as well. So praise God, that might show a little bit more of my age. My older daughter, she's in Portugal at the moment, so she couldn't be here, but you will meet her. We used to play this game in school where we used to like to put our hands in the Bunsen burner. (laughs) It wasn't a good idea. And... um, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the teachers used to say, don't, don't do that. Don't, don't put your hand. The science teacher was a science teacher. Don't put your hands in the Bunsen burner. But would we learn? And then what would happen? We get burned. There are consequences to every action. Can I tell us today? Every action, there is consequences. Don't think that because something negative has happened to you, it has anything to do with Papa. 
we, there are consequences for the things that we do that have nothing to do with God, but we blame him for it. My, my. So death came into the world and God's curse came into the world through the actions of Adam and Amen. This act of disobedience brought about the sin debt. So now humanity needed redemption. They needed their debt cancelled. Hallelujah. It's so, it's so amazing how the Lord works because the trend of the service is really all about what I'm speaking to you about today. So we give God praise. So point two, point two, tell somebody point two. Point two, redemption and justification. Praise the name of the Lord. So let's look at redemption. So redemption means the act of saving or being saved from sin. And you know, sometimes we use these words, atonement, justification, redemption. Nobody knows what they mean. So I'm explaining them today if you don't know, okay? So redemption means the act of saving or being saved from sin, error, or evil. Or it could be summed up as the action of regaining or gaining possession in exchange for payment or clearing a Debt. Somebody said, Amen. So we, as humanity, owed a debt, and that debt needed to be cleared. If I'm emotional, I don't excuse myself for it. It's a heavy sermon, and you'll understand what I mean. Now, to understand redemption, we need to understand the sacrificial system in the Old Testament. Without, and we say this often, without the shedding of blood, there could be no remission for sins. In other words, blood needed to be shed. Now, to cover sin, a lamb without blemish needed to be sacrificed. Hallelujah. And its blood had to be shed. And every sacrifice for sin included the sprinkling or the smearing of blood. Teaching that redemption, which is what man needed, involved a life. For a life. Who is he? Who is he? Now, when a person sinned in the Old Testament, praise God, the high priest, hallelujah, not only had to offer an animal for the people's sins, but also had to suffer, offer, sorry, his own for his own sins. And I always say that I don't believe that there would be enough animals present um, um, to cover or, yes, to cover our sins. There wouldn't be enough birds or goats or lambs for all the sins that we commit. Praise God. So we needed a perfect sacrifice. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So a perfect, sinless sacrifice was needed, praise God, to reconcile man back to God. Oh, hallelujah. Someone, my shakarabosundo, was needed once and for all to become an offering as the final blood sacrifice. You know, if we read through the book of Hebrews, we'll see that once a year the priest would go and offer the animals up, but they had to do it every single year because it only covered the sin, but it didn't take the sin away. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For without a blood sacrifice, 
there is no remission. In other words, no cancellation of debt, charge or penalty for humanity. So the blood of goats and sheep could cover the sin, as I said, but there was a need for a perfect sacrifice to completely atone for our sins. Now, each of us had a sin debt and it needed to be paid. Point three, Jesus, the ultimate sacrifice. Tis the Lord, a wondrous story. Tis the Lord, the King of glory. At your feet, I humbly fall. Crown you, crown you, Lord of all. Praise the name of the Lord. Can we praise the name of Jesus? Can we praise the name of the Lord? Are you coming with me on this journey? Hallelujah. So we're stopping off now on our bus ride to Jesus, the suffering servant. Praise God. Now, I just want to warn you that this is heavy, but I think it's important for us to understand what Jesus paid you know, when you've been in church as long as myself and Andre, it can be just kind of, you know, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. And we don't really think about what Jesus actually did. Oh, we, don't, we don't think about the cost. We, 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 we take it simple. But I'm going to go really deeply into what Jesus did. So it is said that Jesus... Um, may have suffered more physical pain in his final hours on earth than any man in history. If you're in this audience and you're not saved, please listen. If you're online and you're not saved, please listen to what Jesus did for you and I. Now, I strongly believe that in order for one to be devoted to God which is our topic, and to have consistent devotions that it is important to highlight the price that Jesus paid for each and every one of us. We have to know why we're going to be devoted for God. We need to know why. And in order to, to be at a place where we continue to be devoted, it can't be just about things. Oh, God. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? It can't be about things. Because let me tell you, you can have cars, houses, family, and in a split second, they're all gone. It is on Christ, the solid rock we stand. It's not just a song. He is who we stand on. There's a song that said, you can have all this world, but just give me Jesus. Just give me Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The song says, I should have been crucified. I should have suffered instead. I should have hung on the cross in disgrace. But Jesus, God's son, took my place. That is why I am devoted to him. Not because of what I can get from him, 
but because I recognize that I am on a mission from heaven to do what God has designed for me to do, which is to fulfill the assignments of God on my life. We are not just here for his sake. We are not just here to get married. I didn't get married to my husband because I liked him, but I did like him. I got married because of the divine assignments that God was putting on both of us. It wasn't just about love and it looked nice. No, no, no. What is the assignment that God would have us to do? It's about God's work. Praise God. It's about perfecting God's work. You don't look for a partner just for a partner. It's for the purpose. Yes, yes, sir. So the Bible states that Jesus being God in the flesh, do we agree? Knew ahead of time the things he was going to suffer before they happened. I have all the scripture references if you need them, but I'm not going to quote them all now because of time. Now, this caused him such distress that as he prayed in the garden of Gethsemane just before his arrest, they say his sweat became like drops of blood. Come on, somebody. Falling down upon the ground. Now, this rare phenomenon is called hematidrosis. And it occurs when under extreme stress, this is a proper physiological condition, the small capillaries surrounding the sweat glands, they burst and mixed um, with sweat, pour out of the sweat glands. This is what happened to Jesus. He was feeling anguish. So what else did Jesus suffer? Well, I'm glad that you asked. Are you ready? Jesus was betrayed. He was arrested and deserted by his disciples. He was taken to the high priest's house where he was struck in the face by an officer of the high priest. Shortly afterwards, he was blindfolded, then beaten and spit. You know, when you go into school, spit is the worst thing that you can do to somebody, isn't it? Apart from quoting their mom, spit. They spit upon their God. They spit on Jesus. And they pulled his hair out of his beard. And you'll find that in Isaiah 50 and 6. After this beating, he was sent to Pontius Pilate, who questioned him and sent him to Herod after finding out he was a Galilean. Now Herod, along with his men, treated him with contempt. Remember, this is a sinless man. He never committed no sin. Absolutely perfect. Treated him with contempt, mocked him, dressed him in some wonderful robe and sent him back to Pilate. Pilate questioned him some more and then giving in to the crowd's wishes, ordered Jesus to be crucified. Now before being led to the crucifixion site, Pilate ordered that Jesus be flogged. This was a horrific ordeal. In fact, it was so bad that Roman law would not allow Roman citizens to undergo it. Now, if you go into history, you'll know that <laughs> the cruelty of the Romans' punishment was really, really intense. I mean, they would set people on fire and all kinds of stuff for lights at their massive feasts. So this flogging involved Jesus being stripped of all clothing, then tied to a post with his hands above his head to stretch the skin, making the wounds worst. You still with me? He was then flogged by one of two people with what they call a flagellum. And this whip, it's often called a cat of nine tails. Praise God. This whip 
consisted of a handle about 18 inches long with nine leather straps about six or seven feet long. And at the end of each strap was small lead balls mixed with pieces of animal bone or metal. Are you with me? These would tear into the body more and more with each successive lashing with the lead balls ripping into the skin and the jagged pieces of bone of metal tearing it out. As the flogging progressed, muscles, vital organs and even the spine could often be seen openly. This is the price that Jesus paid. Huge strips of skin would be hanging from the body. The act was so diabolical that Jewish law stated that this beating had to be stopped after 40 lashes. I'm going to skip down. They put a scarlet robe on Jesus and they made a crown of thorns, placing it upon his head. These thorns were about two inches long and extremely sharp. Since head wounds tend to bleed easily and profusely, Jesus had blood pouring down his face. Then the soldiers took the robe off him, like tearing off more flesh and putting his own clothes back on him. Now, according to the Bible, Jesus was so weakened from his beatings that he could not carry his cross to the crucifixion and needed a man. Well, a man stepped in called Simon from Cyrene to help Jesus carry the cross. At this point, Jesus hadn't slept for 36 hours and had been walked back and forth several miles between places in his weakened condition. Are you getting a gist of why I'm saying what I'm saying when we're talking about devotion? By the time Jesus reached the crucifixion site, he was probably in what a hospital would call critical condition. At this point, his hands were nailed to the patibulum. And we do talk about the hands, but it wasn't his hands. It was his wrists because the hands wouldn't be able to hold up the weight. So they did it right there between his ulna, his ulna nerve. So that actually pierced him in this area of his body. The nail would rip right out of the hand if it was in the hand. So the wrist, however, could hold a man's weight when done properly. Praise the name of the Lord. Now, after being nailed to the patibulum, he was hoisted up to the top of the vertical beam with the victim attached. And this often caused the soldiers the shoulders to be dislocated and could have happened to Jesus. Now, a prophecy about Jesus was stated in Psalms 22 and 14, which was all my bones are out of joint. Now, once the patibulum was attached to the vertical beam, the victim's feet were placed one on top of the other and nailed to the vertical beam. Sometimes a small platform was placed just below the feet so the victim could push themselves up. At this point, slow death usually occurred. Cruelly, crucifixion was meant to kill victims quickly, but slowly over a period of days. I want to tell us this morning, as I'm coming down, that Jesus did not die for his sin. He died for our sins. God accepted the payment when Jesus cried on the cross. He said, it 
is finished. This meant that this work, his work of atonement to pay for our sins was completed. Praise God. So we use the word that means paid in full. Our sins have been forgiven. We can come boldly to the throne of grace now because Jesus paid it all. Can somebody say hallelujah? Sin has left a crimson stain, but he washes white as snow. So through the shedding of the blood of Jesus, we were justified, which means to be declared not guilty. Hallelujah. Once and for all. Or the process by which sinful human beings are made acceptable to a holy God. And Romans 5 and 1 said, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we are peace with God through our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. So I want you to stand with me at this time. Praise the mighty name of Jesus. So we have seen who is he, who is he, who is he, who is he, his name is Jesus and he is the one who has declared us today not guilty. He is the one who has declared us today holy. Do you believe me? It's in the word of God. You are called and you are chosen. Somebody say amen. You are loved and accepted. Somebody say amen. You are forgiven and reconciled. Somebody say amen. You are at peace and you are free. Somebody say amen. You are healed and be made new. Somebody say amen. You are lifted up this morning. You are full of life. You are full of hopefulness. Full of righteousness. Full of purity. Full of holiness. Full of joy. Full of peace. Full of love. In the name of Jesus. Why? Because Jesus paid it all. Somebody say that word. Jesus paid it all. Say it again. Jesus paid it all. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 So. I want to implore us today to make a decision to be devoted to God. I laid bare the price that Jesus Christ paid for each and every one of us in this place. And if there's a word that I want you to remember, it's that be devoted, be consistently devoted to God. I could go into the prayer and the study of the word, but that's for next time. But when things are not going well in your life and things ain't going good and you're thinking, I can't be asked to pray, I can't be asked to study, I can't be asked to worship... Think about the price that Jesus Christ paid for us. Amen. I just want to give an opportunity at this time for any person, praise God, who is online or in this place who has not accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. If you could play into my heart, Lord Jesus into my heart, come in to stay, come in to, I pray, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Praise God. You have heard the price that Jesus paid. Who is he? He is Jesus Christ who paid it all for you.
Come in to my heart. Come in to my heart. Come in to my heart. Lord Jesus, come in to If you're in this place or you're online and you want to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I want you to repeat after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you for paying the ultimate price on Calvary for my sins. Today, I declare that you are my God. I accept you into my life, Lord. I believe that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross of Calvary. And on the third day, he rose. Thank you, Lord, that I am saved. Thank you, Lord, that I have a new nature. Thank you, Lord, that I am yours. And everybody said, Amen and Amen.